Imagine, you've just spent a decade plus building your business and you get the chance to sell it, which you do for $22 million. What would you do with the money? I said, very completely serious. I'm gonna give it all away to charity. Probably not that, right? <laughs> well, I got the chance to sit down with Derek Sivers, who is an eclectic blend of philosopher and entrepreneur and former circus clown and also the author of the life-changing book, Hell Yeah or No, What's Worth Doing. And here's what we got coming up. I think when you're determined, you'll make anything happen. If it's the most important thing to you, and if it's really your top priority, you'll make it happen. I mean, yeah. maybe you like change or whatnot, but moving is the worst, unless you're a minimalist. Well, I don't have any stuff. So for me, moving takes an <laughs> afternoon. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I mean, there's no stuff here. Moving takes an afternoon. I really like moving to a new house. You built it up and we can get through the rise and fall. But you sold your company for $22 million, but you gave all the proceeds to charity. I mean, it was a profitable company. I had millions and that was already more than I needed. And so when I had this deal to buy my company for $22 million, I had some uh, soul searching questions like, what the hell am I gonna do with $22 million? Welcome to the Mark Drager Show, where we explore the minds and stories of extraordinary entrepreneurs, creatives, and total badasses. Where I wanna start is You've mentioned in your writing that you like to prepare responses because if someone throws a question at you or someone throws an idea at you and you're just immediately reacting, then that's not the true reaction. That's not the, that's not the best thing. And so when you jump onto a podcast or you're being interviewed, you always like a list of questions in advance, you said. <laughs> now, I know I did not send you this list. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I never send out a list of questions in advance. So I'm curious, are you going to simply give us what you say you do not want to do, <laughs> which is you're going to just give us the same old stories that are prepared and all of this stuff? Or am I going to be putting you on the spot and are we going to have to give you time to think? No. A funny thing about the internet is that you can put something out there in present tense and speak in present <laughs> tense and somebody can read it years later thinking that it's still present tense. But no, I used to uh, want the questions in advance. And it's still interesting when somebody does that. When somebody emails me questions in advance of a conversation, I do think about them more because I often get a different answer 15 minutes later than the first answer, if you know what I mean. There's the first answer, and then you think about it a little more, and you think, well, wait, is that really the case? What's another way to think about this? So, um, but anyway, no, I'm thoroughly happy to uh, just wing it. I don't need questions in advance anymore. Uh, Thanks for asking. That is, wow. <laughs> That's interesting that, uh, obviously, I've been told that if you want to truly know who an author is, three years ago, read their book. <laughs> <laughs> mm, right. Yeah. We're putting out the what we're working on today. And if it's in real time, if it's a tweet, or I guess we don't call it tweets anymore. If it's an X, <laughs> have we landed on what we're calling this thing yet? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. So so if it's an X, uh, <laughs> let's not do that. No, let's never make that a thing. Let's not make fetch happen. Um, let's just keep it as tweets. <laughs> because, you know, so it's, you know, maybe he won't use that term anymore. Maybe the term will become open source now. We can all just call them tweets oh. as a generic term. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Like the band aid thing. I, like, so, anyway, so it's a tweet. Um, you know, it's, um, it's an IG story, it's, which I guess they disappear. It's a real, it's a blog post, it's a book. You know, you're putting stuff out there and, um, I did not give you the benefit of the doubt that you would have grown or changed over the years, but that's on me because all of the stuff that I see you putting out there actually speaks about identity shift. It speaks about growth. Mm. It speaks about being able to rewire who we are and learn from our lessons and move past it. And so um, I was trying to give you a gotcha and I, I feel like I was taught a lesson there. Um, <laughs> And so as oh, someone you were who trying to give me a gotcha, you were trying to pull the rug out from under me. Oh, <laughs> yeah, nice yeah, to yeah. know your character. It's nice to meet <laughs> oh, you. <laughs> okay, so let's keep going with this, right? Your character dictates your future. Um, <laughs> so for the listeners, what, what you may not realize is happening is Derek puts out these amazing books, if you haven't read them, where they're just like these like, what I do, is I love to listen to them because they're like two to three minute chapters. Single thought, mm -hmm. single idea that comes from many of the books you've written, many of the people you've spoken to, many of your life experiences. And what has just happened is I think we've probably referenced seven of these types of chapters yeah, very quickly. Sorry about that. Insider <laughs> jokes. But 
But as someone who has lived the last uh, decade plus putting yourself out there, I guess since what, 2010, 2011, putting yourself out there in terms of your writing, in terms of your books, in terms of speaking, how do you deal with the fact that all of us are judging um, an old version of you and, and thinking that we're still meeting you uh, mm. with where you are at? I'm okay with that. I mean, it's all me. Um, I've actually been putting stuff out there since 1994. Um, where, where were you? And hold on. Where were you putting stuff out in 1994? On, were you photocopying it and just putting no, it on, on the internet? So the, um, I was living in New York City and my roommate was a multimedia major at New York University and told me about this thing called the internet that like nobody had heard of. It wasn't in the, uh, common parlance. Uh, so it was a pretty obscure thing that, took real effort to get onto. I had a Mac computer at the time. And check this out. In 1994, the only way to get a Mac computer online was you had to go buy a book called TCP IP Networking for Mac. And in the back of the book, it was like a big 400-page book, was a floppy disk uh, glued into the back of the book, like in a, paper, in a plastic sleeve. Then you had to stick in the floppy disk into your Mac to load a TCP IP driver, and that would let you connect a modem to your net Mac and connect to this new thing called the Internet. And that's when I built my first website in 1994. Uh, so I'm an OG, man. <laughs> <laughs> you, you are. I remember the very first time I went on the Internet. I, bl I think it was 1998. Um, 97, 98, I think it was then. Uh, I was in grade 8. And uh, I was in the library at my school. My friend said, we should go on the internet. And I said, what do you do on the internet? And they said, you just do stuff. You surf. And I was like... And the only two things I knew from television commercials was... Do you remember there used to be the AOL keywords? Right? Yeah. All the commercials would be like, use AOL keyword <laughs> Oprah. <laughs> right. And I knew, yeah. I knew Oprah from my mom. And I knew NASCAR. So wow. I think we went to NASCAR.com. And they had like the rankings there or something of the season. And I was like, now what do we do? And he's like, you're doing it. And I was like, this is the internet? <laughs> wow. Man, but, the, but, it, in 1994, there were no graphics. It was just text. Uh, I remember when graphics came out like later that year or the next year, it was like a new thing that it, it would take like a full 10 seconds for an image to load. You'd watch it load in pixel at a time. And that was a new thing. Like, wow, graphics on the internet. Who would have thought? So you've been putting yourself out there for almost 30 years. Next year, it'll be 30 years I guess, then. I guess so, yeah. Yeah. Does that make you feel old? <laughs> anyway, so, so, yeah, no, I'm, I'm really happy being old. I like it. I like the, uh, the wisdom of experience. It gives more context to the things that happen today, especially because I'm in a technical world surrounded by other people getting uh, excited about technical things that have been around for a few months. And I think I've seen other things come and go in a few months. Like, okay, let's just pick a dumb example that just came up this morning when I was checking email. Somebody mentioned Clubhouse. Oh, and no, I, was I was like... I was pretty oh, yeah. aggressively on Clubhouse for about five months. Okay, so I was like, Club. oh yeah, I've been meaning to check it out. Oh, it's gone. Okay. Yeah, no, well, it's, it's gone. That's, and so, Derek, that is so spring of 2021. Like, <laughs> come on, man. Right. And so... I think when things like that come up and suddenly everybody says, you have to check out Clubhouse. I'm like, yeah, give it a year. If it's around in a year, I'll check it out. I think I've, I'm not conservative in my values and lifestyle, but when it comes to tech, I found it very useful to be a slow adopter because then you just to get to bypass all the noise that just disappears. So this is so interesting to me. So I asked, you know, like, hey, it's been 30 years. You're like, I, I like being older, like wisdom. Yeah. And hey, does it bother you to put stuff out there and people judge you? And it's like, no, I, I, that doesn't bother <laughs> me at all. And so there's two paths in front of us. We, I can keep throwing these like, hey, I'm trying to figure out what bothers you and how you, you overcome it. And you can keep giving me um, what feels like a very um, loving and almost like um, accepting uh, stoic or Buddhist nature about you or whatever it might be. Um, or if we can, have you always been this way? Can we go back to what you used to be like before you were quite so, um, I guess, peaceful? Uh, uh, no, actually, I've always been this way. Uh, I found from a happiness researcher, I think it was Sonia Lombersky, 
if I'm pronouncing that right, at uh, University of California, Riverside, has been studying happiness for decades and said that um, they found that happiness is about 50% DNA and 50% under our control. Like half of it is just you're born with it or you're not. Uh, and I think I got the lucky roll of the dice that I've just always been a happy person. And you have four kids, so I'm curious to hear your uh, experience with this. I only have one kid, and he is also the happiest person I know. He's just always happy. And I think he got the lucky roll of the dice, too. Um, fun, random fact. We just found out last night at the dentist that he, like me, will also never have wisdom teeth. Apparently, that's a pretty rare thing. Uh, and I had it in, I mean... I have that thing that means I'll have never have wisdom teeth and he has it too. But I'm curious, you've got four kids. How different are their natures? It is, it's bananas. It's, um, I don't know, it's... <laughs> Could you put that so, into layman's terms? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the scientific term. We're going to mess now. Um, no, I mean, my wife and I, we got married quite young and uh, she was 22. Uh, she was 21, I was 22. We had our first daughter, 23. Um, and we had a girl. And we were like, okay, great. And my daughter is amazing, Rachel. And, you know, she's turning 17. And, um, but we we're like, okay, this is what a girl's like. And then we had our second, Jonah, a son. And he is, he's a boy, you know, like he, um, we've, he's grown up more and he's now turning 15. And we've learned he actually has ADHD and a few other things. But like, we were like, okay, so this is what a girl is. And this is what a boy is. And we like, we totally got this. Like, it makes total sense. And then we had Silas. Um, a few years later, my, my third, my second son. And we're like, wait a minute. Like <laughs> he's, he's a boy, but he's nothing like Jonah. And, uh, and he's very different than Rachel. And we're like, huh. And then we had our youngest daughter, Jordan, and she is totally different still just completely different. Like, and what I've noticed, uh, because I, I like pattern recognition. I like looking into these things. Um, I noticed that their personality in the high chair Whoever they are and in the high chair at dinner time at the age of like 11, 12, 13, 14 months. Wow. That, that personality is them. Wow. So, uh, my, so, so Silas, um, didn't really speak a lot. Very kind of fastidious. Um, uh, hated having his, hated having food on his hands. You know, like he just, he hated having his hands dirty. Wow. And now that he's, uh, <laughs> he's, uh, you know, preteen. Um, you know, a bit of a perfectionist, doesn't like to make mistakes, likes to look a certain way, keeps his hair a certain way. And I was like, wow, that was like right there, like when he was a tiny little kid. And Jordan, our, our youngest, just used to be so joyful, like belly laughs. She would be sitting in the high chair just like throwing food around and she's just like belly laughing and she loved it and anything could make her laugh. And she was super lit up and super joyous, joyful. And, uh, you know, now she's nine and she's in competitive dance and it's just like, it's so weird and i tell parents now like watch like watch who they are because you can they're going to change and they're going to grow and of course and become the most amazing people but there's something about that core personality that's like baked right in there at one year old in the high chair wow that is so cool that's one of the coolest things i've heard in weeks that is so interesting thanks for that you're welcome. I mean, honestly, I, I have these thoughts and I don't know if anyone cares, but it's so strange how innate um, who they are is and how boys are boys, but they're different and girls are girls, but they're different. And everyone's everyone is so different. Um, mm. I don't know. I don't know how you approach fatherhood in terms of like how much you try to shape who they're becoming mm. while also giving them the freedom um, to make their own mistakes, the freedom to be themselves, the freedom to, um, to approach their own life. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, my deliberate dynamic with him since he was born, basically, is that he's the leader and I'm the follower. So whenever we're together, which I, I put aside about 30 hours a week to give him my full attention. So device is off, work shut down. He's just 30 hours Hold a on, week. 30 hours. Uh, he's my only okay. kid. You know, that's it. So 30 yeah. hours a week. Um, I, uh, he and I hang out one on one and he's the leader and I just follow him and he, Besides everything, but maybe a little bit like the, um, 
you know, what do you call that? The person that whispers into the king's ear, <laughs> you know, like he's the leader. But every now and then, if uh, if I think he's going astray, I'll, I'll say so. Um, and I'll just give a little bit of guidance. But the whole time, letting him practice leading and taking full responsibility for the choices. So he decides what we do every day. And uh, if he doesn't enjoy his day, he knows it was because of his choice that he should have chosen differently instead of blaming me. So I don't know. We've always done it that way. Um I just love letting him lead and just see where he takes us. For, for, for yourself, I mean, I have to imagine that's tremendously rewarding because as you're watching him learn all of these lessons, you're reminding yourself of these lessons too, no? Yeah. Uh, see, you started young. I started old. <laughs> he wasn't born until I was 42. So I'm 53 now and he's 11. Wow. Uh, okay, so for um, listeners, you got to keep in mind, I mean, you, you kind of as we talk about your story and your company, it'll kind of age you, of course, to a certain degree, but you do not look in your 50s. And I turned 40 this year and I feel <laughs> older. <right? laughs> well, yeah, who knows? Maybe the uh, having kids at a young age will age you a little faster. I got to, I was in a circus until I was, you know, 30. So maybe that uh, kept me young, surrounded by jugglers. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, so I don't actually associate his childhood with my childhood very much. You know, the two are so far apart and under such different situations. And I'm such a different parent than my parents were that uh, I don't think about my childhood as much when I'm with him. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I meant more like um, often the lesson that I'm trying to teach my kids or, or, the, or ah. the takeaway. I, I realized like late, a few hours later, you know, my, my son will do something and I'll say, well, what did you expect when you did blah, 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 like natural consequences, mm. yada, yada, yada. And then I'll go away a few days, a few weeks later or a few hours later and I'll be frustrated about something in my life and I'll go, well, what did I expect? You know, natural consequences. And it's just like, I'm like, I find that um, more so than with my team or my friends or anyone else. Um, and maybe it's just my wife and I, my parenting style. We always try to, we, <laughs> our kids are annoyed by it, but we always try to bring it back to the lesson right? Like, mm. like everything is a learning opportunity. Um, and so it's cool. It's cool when things go wrong. Okay. So something yeah. went wrong. It's cool when we make yeah. mistakes. That's fine. It's it like, but what can we learn from it and how can we grow and what can we fix? And usually yeah. I'm trying to like narrate that and reinforce it for them to try and become that empathetic witness for them that can help mm. um, take out some of the sting of the things that are terrible and help maybe uh, knock down some of the ego that might be getting in the way or what have you. And then inevitably I'm like, Mm, I'm just eating my own words because they are just as important for me as they are for them. Yeah. Ooh, good one. I think for me, parenting has been more like meditation practice because when I'm with him, like I said, I, I give him my full attention. So I have things I want to be doing. I have projects that are unfinished and I'm just an hour from finishing, but it's three o'clock and he's coming home from school. So I go, all right, shut down, save my work, turn off the computer, hold down the power button for three seconds on my phone, swipe it to power it completely off. He walks in the door and I just give him my full attention until he's asleep. And then once he's asleep, I go back to uh, maybe another half an hour of wrapping up what I was doing and then I go to sleep myself. But um, that turning off of the um, the work mind and the surrender to his uh, daily leadership, <laughs> if we'll call it that. Uh, that's been more like meditation practice for me. That is a really great way to put that. Um, now, I have to imagine if people maybe aren't as focused on on parenting as you are, or frankly, it, it might be a luxury that that you have oh, yeah. that you've that you've been able that you are able to do so. Yeah. Uh, Wait. Now, hold on. I started to pause right there. So. A luxury, but also a decision that was years in the making. When I was like 13, I heard that John Lennon from the Beatles. Um, no, no, the other John Lennon. <laughs> just, oh, I don't know. I'm speaking to who knows, you know, generational thing. Somebody 20 years old is listening to this. Uh, John Lennon might not be a household name anymore. Um, so oh, that, uh, hurts. that hurts my soul to hear you say that. I know, loud. but you know what's funny? Uh, I was hanging out with some friends that uh, were in their early 20s, and I said uh, something about one of the most amazing things that ever happened to me is when Peter Gabriel rushed up to me after my TED Talk and said how much he liked it. And they went, uh -huh. They don't know Genesis. This, they don't know Peter Gabriel. They don't know I any saw of this it. blank look. I said, 
Peter Gabriel, they went, um, I went, oh God, wow. Peter Gabriel yeah. was a major household name, like not that long ago, but it's right. I guess he hasn't kept putting out the hits. So, you know, okay. Anyway, John Lennon had two kids. His first kid was born during the height of Beatlemania and he wasn't able to give him any attention. So in 1975, when he and Yoko had Sean Lennon, he just told his agent, shut it all down, say no to everything. I'm going to do nothing for the next five years, but be a full-time dad. And that's what he did. And I remember as a teenager thinking, that's pretty cool. Like, I don't know if I'm ever going to have a kid, but if I have a kid, I'm going to do it like John Lennon. I'm going to just shut down everything when I have a kid. And so that's what I did. I was a total workaholic from age 16 to 42. And at 42, when my kid was born, I was like, shut it down, move to the middle of nowhere in New Zealand as just a full-time dad. It was part of the long plan. I remember hearing, uh, I used to be a, f- a big fan of Garth Brooks. Mm-hmm. And uh, he had a crazy wild ride, obviously, through the 80s and the 90s, number one um, country artist. Um, I, I don't have all of his stats memorized, but I think he was the highest earning artist uh, for tours of like all time or something. Yeah. It was a time in the mid 90s, um, I think it was 94, 95, where he won the Grammy for Artist of the Year and he wasn't touring and he didn't put out any new music. Wow. And he had to like leave, he left, he chose to leave the statue like and not accept it because like Green Day wasn't not, and this was like in 94, 95 or something. But um, so wildly successful. But uh, when his daughters were growing up, he decided to stop all of it. All of it. He stopped all of it. And for 10, 12, 15 years, whatever it was, and he fathered and um, he parented. And I remember thinking like, wow, that's like really cool in the back of my mind subconsciously. And then COVID came for us. You know, for all of us, COVID came and I had to stop working the way I worked. I had to stop commuting in. I had to be at home. Uh, I 70% of our projects were put on hold immediately. And so there was just like less to do. And the last few years, I've been parenting a lot more. And um, I'm really proud of it. And I really like how much effort I'm putting in. And I'm really happy to see how much stronger our family unit is. But it... um one, I'm grateful for it because it is a bit of a luxury. But two, it does feel like it's coming at a cost, right? And I think <laughs> and there's a mother's like, uh, dudes, like, yeah, yes, <laughs> us, us women have been sacrificing for our kids and our family for a long time. I don't know why this is news to you, but it feels like it's um, a bit of a, a coming at a bit of a cost. And it, it worries me a bit if um, I know I'm doing the right thing. But at the same time, it's like... Ooh, there's all these other things that I should probably be focused on though. Do you, do you ever feel that way? Um, yes and no. Like the meditation example I gave it's, or comparison I made. It's, uh, there's so many other things I want to be doing, but when I've put aside that time, like from three to 8 PM, uh, and then all day, <clears throat> I always give him all day Saturday and then say like the first half of Sunday before I switch my attention back to my own work. So uh, to me, it's about managing. Actually, you know, I had one more minor role model, Mark Freed from BMI. He was a guy, he got me the first, my first job in the music industry when I was 20 years old in New York City. And um, he... Later told me when he had kids, I said something like, oh, is that hard to work? And he said, you know, when you have kids, you actually become more productive in a way because you don't have time to waste time anymore. Once you have kids, uh, all that wasted time goes away because it's like you have to either work or be with your kid. And all the time you used to spend just kind of eh, like low quality time and you don't have time for that anymore. So he said, I'm actually more productive now that I have a kid. So I feel that way that... um yeah, there are lots of things I want to be doing, but I just squeeze them into the other hours when I'm not with him. Anyway, sorry, I don't, I, I don't know if uh, I feel like I might have accidentally derailed our conversation getting into really long answers about parenting. I don't know if this is what you actually no. wanted to talk about. <laughs> this wasn't, but this is the fun part of the podcast is we cool. go anywhere we want. But I do want to talk a little bit about the music industry. So, so what got you in? Um, what did you do? And ultimately, uh, I mean, uh, you may be tired of answering this question, but I am curious about your exit and why you chose to give away all the money. Sure. Um, well, those are some questions stacked up, huh? When I was 14, I heard 
heavy metal guitar and it just spoke to my soul and it was just like everything else dropped. I was actually into computers uh, for four years before that. I got into computers in 1980. I was just actually yesterday reminiscing about the first program I ever wrote was saved on paper punch cards. This was before discs. Uh, my dad worked at Argonne National Laboratories. He's a particle physicist and uh, had big computers at work. And so I wrote my first program on some, when punch, paper punch cards were the media storage format of the time. Um, so I was into computers from 1980 to 84, but then I heard, I think it was Black Sabbath. And I was like, oh, I need that. I want that. And so I just completely dropped computers and completely just picked up electric guitar. And that was my life. And I just knew like, okay, this is what I want to do. I want to be a musician. So I was completely focused on that goal and, uh, and did it. I went to Berkeley College of Music in Boston, got a degree in music. I was 20 years old. I moved to New York City, straight to the heart of the music industry, partially thanks to Mark Freed. Uh, who I mentioned earlier, he got me my first job at Warner Brothers. And uh, I was in the heart of the music industry at 20 years old. And I was uh, completely focused and completely driven uh, to do it. And was, so, go ahead. Did that all come easy to you? Music, schooling, the job, the transition, moving to New York. Like as we, as we go through these highlights of your life, it, it could appear that's like, wow, it all just kind of worked out. <laughs> well, I think when you're determined, you'll make anything happen. I think of the metaphor of like, if say there's a mountain on the horizon, and if you're just walking towards that mountain, well, then there could be boulders or fallen trees in your way. You'll just step right over them. You don't care. Your eyes are, are staying on that horizon. You don't care about the obstacles. Whereas people that are kind of sullen and aimless staring down at the ground, they'll look at a boulder and go, uh, FML. I don't know what to do now. But uh, it's a mindset. If you're completely determined and driven to get to your goal, then the obstacles just don't even register. You just step around them. So uh, to me, it was easy, but it's because I was so determined. You know, it's kind of like a couple of years ago, I lost uh, 15 kgs. What is that? 30 pounds. And um, somebody asked me how I did it. And I just, well, you just bump it up your values. If it's the most important thing to you, and if it's really your top priority, you'll make it happen. Everybody knows how. You eat less and you exercise, whatever. It's not the how you're looking for. It's just the priority. It's the importance of it. So me becoming a successful musician, a great musician, or at least very good, <laughs> was my top priority in life. And so any obstacles the world threw at me just didn't even register. I just, just stepped around them. I do want to keep going with your story about in the music industry, but this is why you're so fascinating. People love talking to you. You, you <laughs> talked about the importance of priorities, right? So you're climbing for that mountain. You have that goal. Congratulations on losing 30 pounds. That's huge. Um, mm -hmm. I started working out five years ago and uh, I'm about 50 pounds. I had lost 70 pounds, but I had gained some back in muscle, Whoa, hopefully. But uh, <laughs> 70 yeah, for my, for my heavy, for my heaviest to my lightest was a seventy was seventy pounds. Um, wow, I'm up about twenty five from there. But yeah, um, I so I I've I've know how much we can change. Um, but it's interesting because you talked about the priorities, and we were having that huge conversation about being fathers, and you dedicate thirty hours per week to 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 your son and to one-on-one -on -one yeah. time and you Top priority. prioritize him over work, even though it will come at a cost of slowing things down or the projects aren't done as well. Um, and so I'm, I'm already starting to pick up these little themes because um, it seems to me that, that you may be really good at um, dedicating yourself to what you feel is most important um, mm. and prioritizing that. Is that something that comes naturally to you? Yes. My nature... I don't know if it was this way when I was in the high chair, but <laughs> probably, <laughs> but maybe, uh, my nature has always been to focus on one thing at a time. I just learned a new word a couple of years ago, uh, monomaniac, mono one maniac, you know, uh, crazy about, <laughs> crazy about one thing. Um, I've always had that when I was four years old, no, five years old, we got a cat. 
And suddenly I was completely into cats for like five years. So much so that like my teacher at school when I was nine years old called my parents in for a little meeting saying, Derek really talks about nothing but cats. And every time we have a project, he draws cats and we write a story. He writes a story about cats. I just want to make sure you're aware of this. Um, and I was totally into cats until... 1980 when I got into computers and I was totally into computers until 1984 when I got into music and I was totally into music until 1997 when I started CD Baby and then it was all about helping other musicians and I was totally into that until 2008 when I sold my company and deliberately forced myself to uh, lift my head up and um, I don't know what, what one thing you could say I've been focused on since then learning that's such a great monomaniac I like because yeah, good word. I, I always describe it as this um I get obsessed about things. Yeah. And I find context switching really hard. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I have way too many things on the go at one time because I've learned over the last year, especially that I've kind of had ADHD my whole life and not realized it. Mm -hmm. Um but uh but if I have too many things on the go that I'm that are all priorities that I all really are important to me, I get really uncomfortable. Yeah. Because frankly, I just kind of want to obsess about something. <laughs> like, yeah. You know, like if we want to talk about um, gardening, then suddenly it's like I'm researching about, you know, soils and like I just I get <laughs> so into whatever and yeah. I make a crazy amount of progress because it's just like it's so great to just be like focused on this one thing. The downside is everything else in life becomes a distraction from this one thing yes. that you want and need. Um, yeah. And so, what a great lesson. But, let, okay, so let's go back. Um, you're now in New York. Uh, you're, what, a, a superstar, right? And no. So, uh, <laughs> I, uh, I did okay in music. I recorded an album that I'm proud of in 1995, when I was 25, 26. And um, it did all right. It got played on a few hundred college radio stations, and it sold a couple thousand copies. And it was... To when I was building a little website to sell my CD, uh, that's when I accidentally started CD Baby because I just built this thing to sell my CD. But then my friends in New York City, my other musician friends said, yo, dude, can you sell my CD on that thing too? And uh, it was just by saying yes to friends that I accidentally started uh, CD Baby, which then grew and became the largest seller of independent music online at the time. And this was from 1998 till 2008 when I sold. CD Baby's still going strong, I hear, but I left it, in it 2008. Is. It's in Portland, Oregon. It's considered, yeah. uh, the. it's described as the anti-label. Do you ever <laughs> Google your old stuff or no? No, uh, no, not at all. I don't, I haven't been to CD Baby in years. I don't know who works no. there. I don't know anything about it. But um, actually, I don't Google myself either. That's funny. I know that used to be a thing. But uh, anyway, yeah, sorry. <laughs> And so you, you built it up and we can get through the rise and fall, but let, let's get to the, let's get to the question. I'm so curious about so you, yeah. so you sell it for $22 million, right? Or that's your share. Your share is 22 million. No, it was the, this, uh, I was the sole owner. There were no investors. So it was just me. Sole so, owner built yeah. it up from nothing. You sell it for $22 million. Um, do you come from money? Are you super wealthy? Were you really <laughs> great at investing? Do you have a secret? real estate portfolio somewhere that gave you passive income where you could just give this money away. Like you sold your company for $22 million, but you gave all the proceeds to charity. Yeah. I mean, it was a profitable company. You know, it's funny in the dot com uh, and since tech company era, <clears throat> we're used to this idea of companies not being profitable. Like yeah, uh, they, they don't make any know. money. They lose money. You have to have the exit because without that, there's, right. there's no way for you to earn your money back. Right. So no, this was just a, traditional company, um, no investors. Uh, okay. So by the time I sold CD Baby, it was already making like $4 million a year net profit after everything. <laughs> so, so I had... <laughs> so you already had, you had some money in the bank. Yeah, I had millions. And that was already more than I needed. And so when I had this deal to buy my company for $22 million, um, I had some... Uh, soul searching questions like what the hell am I going to do with 22 million dollars okay so anything... why, why did you sell though did you want to get out of it did you want to change oh yeah oh no that's kind of a sad story people say congratulations but no it was a tragedy um uh, I 
the culture, the internal culture of the company was, um, I think I had mismanaged it. I think I was a terrible manager and, um, the culture turned horrible. It was like a mutiny, even though I was the sole owner of the company, uh, the employees, the people that I had hired, a lot of them used to be good friends and slept at my house when they moved to Portland, uh, were staging a mutiny against me and wanted me out because they were like, ah, we want to run the company the way we want to run it. You know, we need Derek to quit telling us what to do. W- meanwhile, I'm paying them every week, you know, and, uh, yeah, it was just awful. And I thought, well, there are a few things I could do here. Actually, I did, um, for about half an hour, I shut the whole company down. It was, uh, late at night after they had this big mutiny meeting, wanting to kick me out of my own company. And I just thought, you know what? This isn't fun anymore. So I logged into the web server and I typed the, uh, control, Apache control halt, which just went and just shut down the website deliberately. And I thought about just replacing it, replacing every page of the website with a page that just said, um, you know, thanks. CD baby has shut down now. Thank you for your business. We'll be returning everybody's CDs. And, uh, and I, while I was writing that text, it was taking too long and it was like after midnight and I thought I just need to sleep. Maybe I'll sleep on this link and think about this tomorrow. So I typed Apache control start. So I booted up the web server again, but that was my emotional disconnect that felt like, all right, I'm done with this. Um, so then I thought of an idea like, okay, maybe I'll just move the whole company across the country. I'll just fire everybody, hire some moving trucks to move all the CDs, rent a new warehouse, hire a new crew and fix this internal culture from scratch. Um, cause I think it was just really a few rotten apples that spoiled the barrel. You know, uh, that really does happen. A few, uh, instigators can just turn happy people miserable. Um, It's funny that this whole, like, we're upset, we're angry, came just months after CD Baby was voted the best place to work in the state of Oregon. Uh, We'd won one of those big awards. uh, And months later, people were, you know, revolution. And um, so then I had the fun idea of doing it like Willy Wonka. You know, So if you remember the Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory story, uh, he decides it's time to hand over the chocolate factory to somebody else. So what does he do? He hides five golden tickets into five chocolate bars. So I thought, wouldn't it be fun to do this in real life? I've got about 4 million CDs in the warehouse created by musicians that desperately want to sell more CDs. How about I hide five golden tickets into five CDs and I will not tell anybody which CDs they are and I'll announce to the whole world saying... Uh, hey, everybody, the new owner of CD Baby will be somebody who finds the golden tickets in here. So um, come one, come all, come buy some CDs. Maybe you'll be the new owner of CD Baby. I really liked that idea. And I got a little down that path to make it happen. And then a good friend of mine said, you know, Derek, the company's probably worth like 20 or $30 million. Um, you know, you could also just sell it. And I went, oh, that's probably smart, isn't it? <laughs> Instead of giving it away to some kid that finds the golden ticket, I was like, yeah, that's probably a better idea. Damn it. I really oh wanted goodness. to do this golden ticket thing. So I honestly hadn't thought about selling. That just never entered my mind. So after uh, Ariel Hyatt, uh, that's my friend who told me uh, that I should consider that option. Um, I said, yeah, okay, that's probably smart. So, um, so the, I'd always had people wanting to buy the company. I'd always told them no. Like almost every month since I started it in 1997, I'd had people wanting to buy the company. And I just, I ended up just telling customer service, like don't even pass those calls to me. Just tell them no, it's not for sale. I don't need to tell them myself. Um, so then after having this thought, like, yeah, I should probably sell, like literally a few weeks later, three different companies in one week contacted me asking me to sell the company. And by default reflex, I told them all no. And then that weekend I went, oh, right, hold on. This is kind of like oh. my friend said. So yeah, then I yeah, called I forgot three. that I am selling the company. And well, I mean, I forgot that I was considering that. It was just, you know, it's like you have your default answer to things. So um, I called all three back and I said, actually, I might be interested. And then um, 
then once I had a couple offers, then I contacted Amazon saying, hey, you know, I just it feels like it wouldn't be right for me to not let you know that this was for sale. So then Amazon came in with a higher bid than everybody else. And I actually chose a company offering less money because I thought they could. Um, I thought that the company would be in better hands. I felt that they understood my clients better than Amazon would. So I chose less money, uh, which was 22 million. And, uh, so to get back to your question of what to do with it, um, so yeah, then I had to get philosophical. Like, all right, I've already paid off all my debts. I have a few million dollars in the bank. I'm fine. Uh, what the hell would I do with $22 million? It's an interesting question to ask yourself in your diary. But isn't, but, but isn't at a deep level, I know this goes against your philosophy, but isn't at a, at a deep level more better? Like, you got a windfall. It, a few million is great, uh, but 22 million back then, especially, I, I think even today, it, it's kind of life-changing money, you know? Well, think about it in a physical metaphor. Uh, would you like a, uh, a wonderful chocolate cupcake. Yes. Isn't more better? Okay, have three. Here, eat 11 of them. No, in fact, eat 115 of these chocolate cupcakes. You know, soon you're throwing up and I say, well, uh, yeah, but there's, there's like a reason I had to lose 70 pounds. Man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to send, I'm going to send a box of 30 cupcakes to your door every day from now. And in fact, I'm going to pull up a truck. I'm going to just give you 5,000 boxes of cupcakes right now. Since you told me you like those cupcakes, there is such a thing as too much. Um, it's a mental disorder. We call those people hoarders. Those people that, that think that they need 75 of something when they actually only need one and they fill their houses and cars with things and they never throw anything out. It's a mental disorder and it's, it's not healthy. So no, I don't think more is always better, especially when you know that there are people that really need the money. There are people that are literally dying because they can't afford the surgery or the medicine or dying because they can't uh, afford protection from the mosquitoes that give them malaria or whatever. And what, and I'm going to just keep this money and buy a Ferrari. And well, just, I, did, I didn't say that though, but you could, you could, you could keep the money and, right. then, and then take the tax right off and help with your other event. Like, I, I don't know. I go into, I know you write about utility mode and stuff like that, mm-hmm. but yeah. I go into like, why not use it? <laughs> well, So that's what I did. So luckily, my lawyer at the time that I was selling CD Baby uh, had a background in tax law. And um, he said, well, congratulations. You know, the deal looks like it's going to happen. What are you going to do with the money? And I said, I'm going to give it away. And he said, are you serious? And I said, yeah, very serious. He said, very serious? (laughs) I said, yeah, very completely serious. I'm going to give it all away to charity. And he's the one that suggested, he said, well, if you're definitely going to do this, he said, we could structure this deal differently. Transfer CD Baby into a charitable trust now. And then the charitable trust will sell CD Baby to the buyer, not you personally. So that way, instead of them paying you 22 million and you paying 7 million to taxes and only giving 15 million to charity, if you transfer the, the company into a charitable trust, the entire 22 million goes to charity and never touches your hands. And I was like, yeah, that's what I want. Never touches my hands. So that's what we did. Mm. Now, when you started to make serious money, um, because you, as you mentioned, the, the company was throwing off profit and cash. Um, did money change you at all? Did you find yourself changing? <laughs> I'm such an asshole now. Um, <laughs> no, I don't, I don't mean that. <laughs> um, uh, I had, a girlfriend that was very skinny. Um, and I'm saying this because she didn't understand why people were always counting calories and worried about what they ate because just her uh, DNA was that she was just skinny, you know, so was her grandmother, so was her mother. Um, and she's like, God, why is everybody so worried about what they eat? <laughs> I was like, because... You're it's like, you got to understand, most people aren't like you. Most people have to be careful what they eat. You seem to never gain weight. And um, so I think having a lot of money feels, I think about her like that. I'm like, why do people care what things cost? 
<laughs> so, so what if the cost of cheese went up? Who cares? Oh, right. Yeah, most people. So I think that's, um, that's the only change that I felt in life is that suddenly everything felt free, if you know what I mean. If something costs five cents, you think of it as free. Once you have millions of dollars in the bank, something that costs $50 feels free. Uh, maybe even 500 Like, it just doesn't even put a dent in your bank account. Um, it helped that I had a both a role model and an anti-role model uh, right before I sold my company. A friend of mine sold his company for $30 million like a year before I did. And um, I got to watch the way he lived and what he did that I liked and didn't like. And um, so I think I was kind of mentally rehearsing it a little bit, like kind of watching him. So when it happened to me, I was a little prepared. So I didn't go do stupid things. What you mistakes what I mean? did he make in your opinion? Um, it's a trick question because what I thought was the biggest mistake, he whimsically bought a $10 million house in central London. And the reason I never wanted that $22 million to touch my hands, the reason I wanted it to go straight to charity is because I was afraid that I might do something stupid like that. And that was the main reason I structured the sale so that the money never touched my hands because I thought I don't want to have $20 million to my name because if it did, I might do something like that and buy a house because it's only $10 million. I said, God, I hope that I'd never do that. Well, the joke's on me because we're still friends and I talked to him a few years later, his $10 million house in London is now worth $30 million. <laughs> So uh, maybe I learned the wrong lesson from that. I don't know. But I think your lesson is still holds true. Does anyone really need a $10 million house when you can get by on like a 7 or $8 million right. place, right? <laughs> Actually, I'm working on this right now. Here in New Zealand, I bought a... Uh, a dumb little piece of land off grid. There was like an auction I just put in a low offer, a ridiculously low offer, and I was the only one that bid. So I won a little piece of land here in New Zealand. And I was thinking about what to do with it. And I could put the home of my dreams on it. And I have spent so many hours thinking about what that would be or how sh I should approach this until I very slowly realized the home of my dreams was... Uh, or what I was calling the home of my dreams, was trying to live up to some ideal of what I felt I should be wanting. Because honestly, I spend all of my time in a tiny little room, um, like, th I guess, three by four meters. Uh, and I just work basically every waking hour that I'm not with my kid. And when I'm with my kid, we go out. We don't hang out in the house. So really, my dream home is tiny. Uh, and just last night, I think I'm making a decision to buy a little prefab, well-made, well-insulated, ready-to-go, tiny home. And that's what I will put in my piece of land and become my home. That's anyway. brilliant. That's brilliant. I, um, I really like... I'm a car guy. I don't own a lot of cars um, because... Frankly, I don't go anywhere anymore. <laughs> and just like, I used to drive a lot, right? I drove, mm -hmm. I, I used to drive 35, 36, 37,000 kilometers a year. Right, which, let's just say, if you drive a lot, then having a good quality car makes a massive difference in the quality of your life. Like that they used to say, be my excuse with my wife. <laughs> it's, it's, but it's not even an excuse. That's smart because they say that the things that are closest to you physically are the things that you should splurge the most on quality. Have mm. the best quality shoes. Have the best quality mattress. These are the things that you spend most of your waking life in. So, or sleeping life, <laughs> most of your life in your, uh, your shoes, your mattress, things like that should be high quality. So yes, if you're driving that much, it's thoroughly rational to splurge on the best comfort for your car. Sorry. So, so this, no, this is actually helping me because I realize I'm realizing as I'm talking to you now, that's a past version of me. So last mm. night I'm out for a walk and I see this truck 
Um, and I've got a truck. It's a good truck. You know, it's a 2016 and it's okay. But I used to drive so much that I would replace my vehicle every two or three years. And I would always like, it would always be like an expression of me and I would get to pick it yeah. and it would be something different and it was fun and it was exciting. And now I've had this truck like seven or eight years and it's super functional because all I do is go to the grocery store or to the gym or uh, to like Home Depot. Like that's pretty much my life. But yeah. I'm walking by this truck and I'm like, man, that's a good looking truck. And it's like, should I? I'm like, oh, maybe next one. It's like, but the, do I need to spend a hundred thousand dollars on a new truck when there's nothing wrong with my old one? But not right. only that, but not only that, this new truck isn't really functional for my family of six. So right. I think I should probably also like, I really kind of want a Jeep though too, because they're convertibles <laughs> and they're standard. And I was like, well, if I could get a new truck and a Jeep, but but those are both like UT, US, like they're kind of bigger things. And it's like, I also like, you know, want a, a little sports car for my wife and I to go out on date nights with. And here's the other thing about me. I own a motorcycle and I have dirt bikes with me and the kids. And I don't go anywhere, right? Yep. So I caught myself going like, I could figure out a way in my life to buy all these things, to pay for the insurance, to somehow store them, you know, in my garage or build some new garage or driveway <laughs> or something, like build something to store all these things just so they could depreciate in value. Right. And not actually add anything to my life. And yeah. I was like, but, but I really want them. And then I hit this thought. I texted him to myself, just because you want it doesn't mean you get it. Doesn't mean you need to work for it. Cause I'm an entrepreneur. So I'm always like, okay, if I want it, let's work. Let's get it. And it's like, right. But, but I'm like, I don't have to have these three vehicles. <laughs> and I yes. don't have to work towards them. And I don't have to do any of this stuff. Right. Uh. <laughs> And in fact, what are you now? You're going to be a maintenance man for these three vehicles. Now it's like you've got to steward these things and and take care of them and house them. And well, ideally, I'm also going to hire a, PA, a personal assistant to help manage all this stuff because my life. We keep adding. My wife and I. We keep adding to our lives. And now you've got um, to employ somebody to take care of the stuff you bought. Like, what are you doing? That's. I know that's. This is um. God, this is so, I never talk about this, but this question is on my mind so much. It's a messed up thing to have the ability to buy anything and then have to be philosophical about what's worth doing. Uh, that was my second book, Hell Yeah or No. What a great book, let me just say, if I can, Thanks. please. What a great book. Um, <laughs> And this is, uh, this isn't a real problem to me. And yet it's something that I have to constantly wrestle with. It doesn't feel, it doesn't feel like a justifiable problem when there's so many more problems to have. Wait, like, see, that kind of thing that you're talking about right now is kind of the root of philosophy for me that thinking about these cars for you, like, what's the real point? Why? Do I need them to get somewhere? No, I have something. On the other hand, would they bring me so much joy that even though I don't need them, that's what life is about. But then you've got to like really balance for yourself. Like how much happier would it make me to have the nice shoes, even though my existing shoes work or the nice Jeep when my existing vehicle works? Because you might still make the decision. Say like if you love bicycles and you ride bicycles a lot, and there's like a new Trek e-bicycle that the people into e-bikes say is the best e-bike on the market. And at least here in New Zealand, it's $17,000. And I remember looking at that going like, if I really cared about bikes, that'd be interesting. But I don't care that much. I have like an old steel bike that's fine that I hardly use. So even though I could do it, why would, and you, then you've got to value, ask yourself what's more important because if you buy a thing, you're going to put some hours into it. Um, but is the hours spent on that thing perhaps better spent with your kids and not having the thing and just letting it be something you go, yeah, now I know that there's a really nice Jeep out there. Um, I can just be happy. To know that exists, maybe I can rent it for one night, find somebody who's renting it, and I can spend a night driving that Jeep. And then you get into questions of identity. Like, is it that I just think of myself as the person that has that Jeep? And if that's so, 
is it for telling other people that I have that Jeep? Do I want other people to know that this is who I am? Or is it truly just for me? Like, would you still buy that Jeep if nobody but you knew you had that Jeep? And if so, then what's that about? Why do you think that your identity is based on a thing? Which is my favorite comeback when the uh, Instagram hashtag, look at me, I bought a car. Uh, I've always thought, well, any idiot can buy a car. <laughs> Just go with your credit card and you say there. Now I've bought the car. That takes no skill at all. <laughs> what takes but, skill? But it, but it is an achievement for those who have worked towards it. Maybe paying it off would be. I think there are a lot of people who <laughs> put okay. the car on their credit card just all, to shoot. See, see, here's the thing. I mean, I, I don't know if I should say it. I buy all my cars for cash, which yeah, cool. is, is actually apparently terrible. Uh, I've been taught that you should never pay cash for depreciating asset, but I don't know. We buy everything for cash. So if we have the money, we buy it. If right. we, we don't. <laughs> okay. See, that's an example of um, two different very wise people I've read uh, authors on money. Um, oh boy, what's his name? Um, the philosophy of money. Uh, I'd recognize his name if you said it. Um, but also the one I just read, William J. Bernstein. Morgan, wrote. Morgan Housel, the philosophy yes, of money. Thank you, Morgan. Yeah, I'm on, I'm on your, if anyone wants to know of all the books Derek's read, go to yes. his website. Cause he has a whole yeah. list of books there. <laughs> S-I-V-E dot R-S slash book singular you will see my list of the last 400 books i've read since 2007 I, with detailed notes on every one even uh, even older actually because the art of profitability which i was like you've read that that's in such a great book uh, i think you referenced it to 2005 oh okay cool um so um 2007 is i remember where i was when i started taking notes uh so that's when i st- started taking notes in 2007 anyway but um both morgan housel and william j bernstein both brilliant authors on the subject of money and investing separately in their respective books said uh, that even though it may make rational sense to take on debt, um, that they just choose to pay things off, that they emotionally like the way it feels better to know that their debts are paid off. So they say, even though I could earn more money by getting a mortgage than investing the money myself, I would rather just have my debts paid off. And ultimately it comes down to how you feel. So I feel the same way. Pay it off, yeah, pay cash. It's interesting. When my wife and I bought our first place, um, a little semi-detached, um, and uh, <laughs> we closed in August of 2008 on our first house. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, that was right before the recession. And we made sure to try and get something much lower than the banks told us we could afford. Um, we had a really small mortgage, which was very helpful because when the recession happened, my company was making no money for like a year and a half. But yeah. um, that $300 mortgage payment or whatever it was, which is again, very small, um, we had a scrape to get by. But a few years later, uh, you know, the company turned around and we started making better money. And so I think we were like 29 or 30 and we paid off our mortgage. Um, nice. And it felt so good. Like it, it yeah. felt so good to be like, I have no debt. Um, and I also, I always like to preface this with, I realize how privileged we are, um, yep. that I worked and then went to school and used the money I earned to pay for my school. So I graduated with zero debt. Um, yeah. And then I worked and worked and worked and worked and worked and worked. Um, and we paid off that debt. And then my wife's like, let's buy a new place. Uh, so nine years now we've been in this place. And um, I'm glad we got in when we did because the market's gone crazy. But I'm also in this situation where I was like, I think we could pay down our mortgage more aggressively if we wanted to. Mm. But it doesn't make any sense. Like like what you're okay. saying, like there's two different things here. Like it just doesn't make any sense for me to do that rather than take whatever money we could pay it down with and just invest or do all these other things. Mm-hmm. But it feels so good to like not have to make the mortgage payment and to know that you own your place and to know you are debt free and all of that stuff. It just darn, it just feels so good. <laughs> Yeah. And to me, everything comes down to that feeling anyway, right? Like everything we do, the reason you're doing this podcast, the reason you buy a a truck. (laughs) You would say a Jeep. (laughs) Yeah, I was trying to (laughs) switch it up. Um, So uh, it all, it just comes down to how you feel anyway. And then what's 
weird about that is that you can manipulate how you feel just by thinking of things philosophically and choosing a different angle. Like, um, choosing that, uh, say with, uh, your business, it makes you happier to be generous than it does to be profitable. Um, that can completely flip the way you run your business. Actually, since we're talking about homes, want to hear one that I, uh, a, an uncommon preference of mine. I really like moving every year or two. Um, I really I, I, enjoy that it. That is, I, I, that is, I mean, I, I understand maybe you like change or whatnot, but moving is the worst. I mean, unless you're a minimalist. I don't have any stuff. So for me, moving takes an afternoon. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> I mean, there's no stuff here. Um, so yeah, moving takes an afternoon. I really like moving to a new house. I mean, I really would prefer to move countries every year or two. Um, but uh, for now, since my kid's in school and his mom works at the government here and uh, she can't move, um, I really like moving houses. And uh I'm really glad of all the different, like, I don't value stability. Stability to me is, um, is way down my value list. In fact, I think it's maybe on, in the negative. <laughs> uh, I, yeah, I do not value stability. Stability to me feels like something's gone wrong in my life. I like constant change, um, learning, growing, uh, new experiences, all that kind of stuff. Anyway, so, but once you know, that you have this value system, once you realize this in yourself, like they, okay, I like moving every year too. It helps shape so many other decisions because now anytime I think about, um, what was it? Just last night I read about this thing. I, I needed to steam my jacket and I was like, okay, do I need a portable handheld steamer? And somebody said, well, ideally you should invest in a steam closet, um, where you could hang your clothes and close the door, seal it tight, and it steams them overnight. So I thought about that for a mere two seconds before I realized that would make it harder to move every year. That would be a big thing I would have to move. I couldn't move that to Dubai. I couldn't move that to Brazil. It would be stuck here. Whereas if I get the portable steamer, I can bring it with me to Dubai and Brazil and Finland and wherever else I move. Um, therefore, I will be getting the portable one. So once you know that you have a certain preference, you can shape all the decisions along the way. My sister, on the other hand, she's only two years younger than me. Her top value in life is stability. She loves having this house and luckily her husband agrees. They have three kids, two dogs. They've been in the same house for 30 years. It makes them deeply happy. Good for her. So her house is filled with stuff because they know that they're going to stay there forever. Like this is, this is the house we're going to die in. That makes them very happy. Um, so it's all about, you have to know your own values. Don't try to uh, adopt other people's values just because they are glorified and famous. Um, you have to know for yourself what your values are and then shape your own life decisions accordingly. Yeah. You talk about, there's a chapter in, in Hell Yeah or No where you talk about like, if you know that you want to be wealthy, then first, like, admit to yourself you want yeah. to be wealthy and then start doing the steps that's required to become wealthy. And I think you mentioned that in, in reference to, like, hey, you spent time in Hollywood and yeah. the people who have the most fame, i.e. attention, um, don't have the most money. And yeah. the richest people in Hollywood, you would have no idea who they are because yeah. they're because they because if you want fame then you have to just work so hard constantly to get the spotlight and get the attention. Yeah. Whereas if you want money, it's something else. And I, yeah. I think the, the more freeing thing though in, in the whole lesson is like, just be comfortable. Like it's okay to, to want what you want and mm -hmm. not to judge yourself perhaps for that. Right, because no matter what you your preference, somebody's going to tell you that you're wrong. Somebody's going to attack you for it and say, you jerk, you idiot. That's wrong. You shouldn't want that. You should want what I want. Let me tell you my values and those should be your values. Time, you should <laughs> want to live in a place for 30 years and collect a bunch of junk like I have. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, any values. I mean, even if um, whenever I say that I've given some money to charity because even after selling my company even now when i sell my books i've uh i give that money to charity too so it's i've given over half a million dollars to uh, uh the against malaria foundation from selling my books 
And there are people that come out and say, you idiot. <laughs> That's stupid. It, it's, it's irrational. You should spend that money on it. And they tell me what I should be doing with it. And, uh, on the other hand, um, the, when I set up that charitable trust, it pays me out my living expense. And there's some people that tell me I'm wrong for having that. They're like, you jerk. You're keeping that money. Why didn't you just, you know? So no matter what you choose, you're going to get attacked. People are going to tell you you're wrong and stupid. And so you just have to have a secure sense of who you are and who your preferences are. I mean, what your preferences are. And uh, just understand that uh, you're going to be attacked no matter way, no matter what. Now, the reason I love this book list on your website is uh, one, I mean, I got a little thrill each time I would scroll and be like, oh, I've read that book. Oh, I love that book too. Oh, I've read that book because, you know, it just makes me feel like, you know, you and I are both cool people who've read all these books. <laughs> but um, but it also is like, oh, well, if it's, I've started following, my life has changed quite a bit since I've started following this new rule I gave myself, which is if someone I respect has written a book or read a book and liked it, that I don't question it, I just buy it and read it. Yeah. So, so, uh, Ryan Holiday in at the end of one of his audiobooks is talking to, uh, Tim Ferriss, uh, cause Tim Ferriss produced the audio versions of Ryan Holiday's books. And they're both kind of just quickly rhyming off. They're like, Oh, I like small giants. Oh, I like this book. Oh, I like that book. And I was like, I'm like just taking notes and I'm like, Oh, oh I got to read these. And then I do. And they're just mind blowing how much, um, effort authors put into giving you. Yeah. All of the things that they've learned and that you could buy it for like 15 or 20 bucks. or $30. Yeah. <laughs> and all right. I have to do is just listen to it or read it. And it's all yeah. there. Blows my mind. Where yeah. I'm going with this is I'm curious and, and you don't have to listen in front of you and that's fine. Um, what are the books that you believe have shaped you the most? Ooh. Number one, by far, without question, Tony Robbins. Awaken the Giant Within. Really? Because it matters when you read something. So yeah, Tim mm. and I talked about this, that he read The Magic of Thinking Big as his first self-help book when he was a teenager. And it changed his life. And then by the time he read Awaken the Giant Within, he was like, eh, I don't know, not great. Oh, that's such and a so good point. I had the reverse. So I read Awaken the Giant Within as like my first major self-help book and it blew my mind. And then when I met Tim in 2007 and he was telling me like, oh man, the magic of thinking big, that's the one that changed my life. I was like, ooh, can't wait to read this one that changed Tim's life. And uh, I read the mag magic of thinking big. I was like, eh, same old shit. <laughs> but mm -hmm. it matters which one you read first. So yeah, to me, Awaken the Giant Within is a flawed, uh, messy book now full of very outdated references to O.J. Simpson and Michael Jackson and Enron and whatnot. Uh, he wrote it very much to be timely in 1989 or 90. And, um, but man, I read that book when I was 19 and again when I was 21 and again when I was 23. And it shaped the way I see the world so much that I didn't even realize how much it's shaped the way I see the world. Kind of like, uh, people don't realize how much their religion shapes them, right? Like if you talk to somebody uh, in India that was brought up Hindu, that all their friends were Hindu and, and just everybody's Hindu and you get, and if they're talking to somebody who just grew up Christian and everybody around them is Christian, they don't even realize, like to them, it's just like, well, duh, this is the way the world is. I mean, you come back again and you, you know, it's the karma and that's why you know, the, the woman in poverty is the way she is because she did something in her past life. Obviously, that's just how life works. Um, but then you compare it to somebody else with a different worldview and they don't realize it's their books that have shaped their view. Like none of these things are real. None of these things are absolutely positively uh, undeniably, objectively true. It's just the filter, uh, the perspective that their religion has given them. So that's what Tony Robbins' Awaken the Giant Within did to me. It was like my religion without realizing it because I ingested it at such a uh, formative age that uh, the whole way I see the world is shaped by that philosophy. Hey, what, a, what a great story. And as you were describing that, I was thinking, you know, this is just a few years ago now. Um, 
and I've read some self-help stuff earlier, but Marie Forleo's Everything is Figure Outable, um, mm. which I think came out in 2018 or 19. But I, 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 remember, I remember downloading it. I remember she was on Tom Bilyeu's show, Impact Theory. I heard it. I liked it. Um, I downloaded it. And it, it gave me permission to make mistakes as, as a recovering perfectionist. And then I was lucky enough uh, last year, I think, I was Ed Milet's book launch. Um, helping behind the scenes with some stuff. And Marie was one of the speakers there. And kind of I pulled her aside and said, listen, I, I, I hope you don't think this is unprofessional, but I just wanted to say like how impactful your book was for me and how, you know, this story and this all shaped it and everything. And, and I said, and I'm just, I don't know if I'm breaking the rules because I'm not like asking you to sign it or anything, but just thank you. And she gave me a hug. And she's like, no, tell any author you meet. <laughs> like if you ever meet anyone who's written anything, tell them if their book has helped them because they never get tired of that. Uh, it, but yeah. I had not, I know that there's a book for a different time. You know, I have, I have certain books where I'm like, I need like, um, the subtle art of not giving a fuck. I started it and it just wasn't, it wasn't for me. It bounced off hmm. me. I didn't, I, I was like this, it's too, it's too cliche. It's, there's too many swear words. Like I get it already. <laughs> like, right. Like how many times can you say fuck? Like I get it. Um, and it just didn't do anything. And about a year and a half later or whatever, I, I was like, oh, let me circle around on this thing. And I was like, this is the greatest book ever mm-hmm. <laughs> so, written. And uh, so I know that there was timing, but I've never really considered how, you know, the, the, the books that introduce you to something, I guess, like music, right? You'll remember that Black yeah. Sabbath was that right. song or that right. artist that got you into it. <laughs> um, whereas if you heard something else, it would have been that. Great comparison. Yeah. That Black Sabbath song does nothing for me now. <laughs> and that's okay, because yeah. yeah. you're allowed to change what you like, right? <laughs> yeah. Ah, very cool. I, I thank you so much for, for your time and for jumping on the podcast with me. I do have one final question for you. Um, before you go, at the end of the day, what does it all come down to? <laughs> I was thinking how fun it would be to completely change the tone and say, at the end of the day, you know really all comes down to you buying my book, everyone. <laughs> yeah, money. <laughs> At the end of the day, buy my book. Um, well, but we know that's going towards, you know, mosquito nests or anti-malaria medication. So yeah. you could do the PBS <laughs> like, you know, like for every book that we sell, we help one more person in need. Let's get some books sold, people. Let's go. <laughs> but, you know, that's a messed up motivation. That's a fascinating subject of, um, what was it? Uh, Daniel Pink had the book called Drive. Yep. That, that dove into people's motivation that if somebody's doing something, like if they're donating their uh, volunteering at an organization and doing something nice and charitable and, and uh, generous, and then you offer to pay them, it completely changes the incentives. And then people start to complain more about their work because they're internally representing it as something they're doing for the money. Whereas if you give them no money at all, they internally represent it as something they're doing to be good. So I actually hate when people say like, buy this book because it gives money to charity or uh, donate to my walk across Illinois because it's going to raise money for breast cancer or whatever. Just think, well, what, no, separate. Like, if you want to give money to cancer research, then give the money. And if you want to buy this book because it benefits you, then get the book. And it's so messed up when people uh, braid those things together. Um, Sorry, uh, your real question was, at the end of the day, what does it come down to? Was that the question? It was, yeah. (laughs) Um, hmm. Let me think. I think everybody has their own answer. I think at the end of the day, if I can think of something universal for everyone. It could just be for you even. I know, but and, and, but I do these podcasts for the listener. I, I'm, I don't really need to talk about myself Oh, I do more. these podcasts for me. <laughs> okay. I'm just, I'm just joking. I'm just joking. Um, but uh, I think anybody listening to this, the what it comes down to at the end of the day is to try to shut out the noise of the world, to think of it as input but um, detach from it a bit and spend some time with yourself, whether it's in a journal or just sitting there thinking or talking to a friend um, about what really matters most to you. Uh, To me, the most interesting bit of this conversation, besides the high chair uh, personality thing, which was fascinating, was this thing about the Jeeps and the trucks and this desire to 
have more or have that and how philosophical that gets to question why you even want something, why you're even on social media, why you put yourself out there, why do you go to work? Why are you doing this? Why do you want to get married? Why do you want kids? Um, we do so many things just by default or because other people have told us we should value this. And I think we can feel a such discomfort in our gut or such this like molasses kind of drain of energy that everything feels hard. And I think it's because we're living a life isn't really our life. We're trying to live someone else's life. We're trying to walk other people's talk. Oh, I like that. <laughs> uh, I've never said that before like that. Um, uh, and you just feel the friction of that, of like your natural nature might be this way, but you're trying to make yourself go this way because people tell you that's what you should be valuing. So at the end of the day, to answer your question, what it all comes down to, I think, is knowing yourself well enough to walk your own path, to go with your nature, and then you'll just find that everything flows easier because you're doing what suits you. 